Important question for USMLE. Students will frequently get this stuff wrong because they're not sure about some of the variables here. It's okay, I'll dissect it. Relax. Before we get started, subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Help bring awareness to this channel. Share it with one of your friends who's prepping for USMLE. Hit the like button. Hit the bell if you want notifications. And find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical, M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical, and the link is down below. Now, let's start the fucking question. 64-year-old woman, 30-year history, type 2 diabetes mellitus, one-week history, nosebleeds and fatigue, her creatinine is 2.2 milligrams per deciliter, and we have a renal biopsy shown. You need to know, so the starting point here is that diabetes mellitus, type 1 and type 2, most common cause of chronic renal failure, okay? Why does this patient have nosebleeds? This is called uremic platelet dysfunction. When your blood urea and nitrogen is high in the setting of renal failure, it causes a qualitative, not a quantitative, okay? A qualitative dysfunction of your platelets where you're going to have an, an up arrow for bleeding time, no change platelet count, okay? Patient needs hemodialysis in that setting, but that's how the nosebleed, that's the relevance of the nosebleeds. Patients who have anemia of chronic disease in and of itself, that is not responsible for nosebleeds, okay? In order to get nosebleeds, you need to have platelet dysfunction and renal failure. So just keeping this concise and moving forward. Creatinine is 2.2 milligrams per deciliter. Normal range should be about 0.7 to 1.2. If you've hit a creatinine of 2, you've lost about 90% of your renal function. So this patient is quite compromised in terms of renal function. This image, this biopsy, is of chymal steel Wilson nodules, which are composed of hyaline. I actually jacked this image off of Wikipedia, and then I rotated it horizontal and vertical. Okay, but it's the same image off Wiki. And this is just something, these, they almost look like pink circles, okay? The, the hyaline chymal steel Wilson nodules, that's seen in late diabetes, okay? Uh, diabetic glomerulosclerosis, just something you need to know for your simile. Now let's look at these variables, and I'm gonna keep this as concise as I can be because this can get very confusing. So in the setting of renal failure, the kidney is not going to be able to carry out its normal function of activating vitamin D3 as well as it should. So normally, in the PCT of the kidney, we have 25 hydroxy D3, which is inactive. PTH comes in, parathyroid hormone, and it will activate one alpha hydroxylase in the, PT, in the PCT of the kidney, converting this inactive 25 D3 into active 125 dihydroxy D3. Okay? Kidney can't do that as well as it should, meaning in the setting of renal failure, we, we're going to have decreased 125 dihydroxy D3. Okay? Now, that means that there's going to be a quote unquote buildup of 25 hydroxy D3. But the body doesn't really store 25 hydroxy D3. If there's a buildup, it's going to get shunted to another inactive form called. 2425 dihydroxy D3. So for all intents and purposes for USMLE, you should think of this 2425 as just another inactive form, as the same as 25 hydroxy D3, okay? So in the setting of renal failure, we know we're going to have an up arrow for 2425 uh, dihydroxy D3 because our 25 is not being able, is not being converted to 125, so it's shunted to 2425, as I just said, okay? So an up arrow for 2425 D3. Now, if we have less 125 active D3, that normally will go to the small bowel where we absorb calcium and phosphate. If we can't absorb calcium as well as we should because our 125 is low, our serum calcium goes down, which that in and of itself is high yield for renal failure questions. So you're going to have a down arrow for serum calcium, okay? That down arrow for serum calcium is going to cause PTH to go up. We now have secondary hyperparathyroidism. Primary means the gland itself is fucked up. If we had separately primary hyperparathyroidism, that could be a parathyroid adenoma. It could be parathyroid hyper diffuse foregland hyperplasia, okay? That's primary. 
The gland itself is messed up. But if there's another cause, an outside, a cause external to the parathyroid gland, such as renal failure, causing your PTH to go up, it's called secondary hyperparathyroidism. So if we can't absorb calcium through the small bowel because 125 dihydroxy D3 is low, PTH will go up to compensate. Secondary hyperparathyroidism. Now, this relates to ALP. US simile wants you to know that parathyroid hormone at bone is going to bind to osteoblasts, activating the osteoblasts to express rank L on their cell surface. Rank L on the osteoblast will bind to rank receptor on the osteoclast, activating the osteoclast. Act osteoclast will then resorb the bone, thereby increasing serum calcium to compensate, okay? USMLE wants you to know that ALP activity reflects osteoblast activity in many circumstances. Okay, we're not going to get into all the exceptions right now about the biliary ducts, etc., but just, or even placental ALP, but just if we have increased PTH, there's increased osteoblast activation at the bone, ALP goes up. So we said in renal failure, so far we have an up arrow for 24, 25 dihydroxy D3. We're going to have an up arrow for serum ALP because PTH is high. And then we say, well, what about CO2? Okay. So in the setting of renal failure, you need to know that that's one of the mud piles. Okay. High anion gap metabolic acidosis. It's the U. Uremia means renal failure. Okay. It's a cause of metabolic acidosis, which means we have a low serum bicarbonate. So we are going to blow off our CO2 to compensate. Okay, so we would have a metabolic acidosis decreased by carbonate, and then we would blow off our CO2, which is acidic, to compensate. So we, in this question, our answer is going to be choice B, increased 24, 25 dihydroxy D3, increased serum ALP, and we're going to have decreased PCO2. Okay, now look, once again, we could do a very lengthy discussion, make this a 45-minute endocrine, biochem tutorial, etc. I know some of you guys want more detail. Some of you guys want concise clips. I'm going to keep things more on the consolidated end. I'm obviously going to make more content. You know the deal. So if you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel. And I appreciate your time. That's it.